Hey guys, this is the second video in a series looking at various elements of my composition process by using tracks from the New World Empyria from the King's Isle game Wizard 101. The response to the first track was really great and a lot of you had some good suggestions uh, on things that I could talk about. And if you've got any other suggestions or questions, please don't be afraid to leave those down in the comment section because uh, I'll be doing some videos like this um, as fast as I can crank them out. So in this video, we'll be looking at how I approach writing action music and specifically looking at this track. It's called Sapidius Combat, which takes place inside a giant space, giant flying space squid, as it was described to me by the developers. When you write for video games, you usually ask for two general types of music, exploration tracks and combat tracks. I personally find combat tracks to be a lot more challenging for a few reasons. When you're writing for exploration tracks, you're really trying to set the scene uh, for that part of the world. And usually those scenes can kind of shift dramatically. It's industrial or it's natural, it's organic, or it's, you know, in a, it's in space or it's in a house. You know, there's a lot of potential artistic directions uh, that you can take it. For combat tracks, you're mostly trying to describe the action and, and action tends to be action. You know, it's there's you're, you're trying to describe the human emotions of like you know desperation and you know adrenaline pounding and you know all the energy that that goes behind that so in combat tracks you're trying to describe one thing exploration tracks you're setting the scene and getting to describe a lot of other things so i find combat tracks to be it's harder to come up with new material because it's it's the same thing no matter where you are. So the other reason that uh, combat tracks are usually more challenging is that they're at a faster tempo. Uh, this one's at quarter note equals 108 BPM, but if you look at the time signature, it's in 6, 8, so it's actually moving along twice as fast. as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's moving along pretty good. Faster tempos mean you're, you're actually filling more bars. To, to, to go to your time limit. So I usually write two minute loops. I'm asked to write two minute loops by the developer. And if I have to do it at a faster tempo, I just, I need to write more bars to fill that two minute. So we, we, the main kind of idea that we're trying to get across is that we want to keep them off balance. You know, we don't want them to be able to anticipate what's coming next because that makes it feel more tense and feel more things really matter right now. We also, and this might be surprising, the music should be making the player feel a little bit uncomfortable so that they want to move on so it kind of propels them forward. I usually wind up alternating uh, between inspiring the player like trying to push them forward by giving them you know really big epic themes to make them feel inspired and then putting them in an uncomfortable position so we're trying to make them feel uncomfortable yet inspired and desperation and adrenaline and keeping them off balance so let's listen to this track first uh, and then i'll talk about some specific examples of how i'm doing this
that's the loop where it goes back to uh, the top again. So we're looking at specific examples of where uh, we're trying to go against expectations. We're trying to thwart any sense that the player knows where the tune is going. Uh, right here at the beginning, we're kind of setting the stage a bit. Right here, I set an energy level uh, and then try and crank it up a little bit almost immediately. I, I might have talked about this before, but I really believe in uh, dynamics in music. It's what makes music exciting. There can't It can't be at one energy level the whole time. So I like to pull the energy levels up and down, you know, build it up and then and kind of break it down. That's the, the normal ebb and flow uh, of a story. Like if you think about a movie, kind of the dramatic arc. Now in the real world of orchestral writing, strings actually can play for longer than the wind instruments, wind, wood, woodwinds and brass, uh, because, you know, they're not buzzing their lips or having to blow into the instrument and, you know, you need to take a breath eventually. Strings can kind of go all day. These are obviously samples. I could I could hold down a brass note all day and the, the sound would keep happening, but I don't like to do that. I try and write, you know, as realistically as practical for any situation because if you want your music to sound real, then you have to consider the things that a, you know, a composer for a live orchestra would consider. One of the techniques that I use here, so the strings are doing the spiccato line. Uh, I'm soloing the, one of my spiccato sounds. And it's a little mushy there. It sounds a little sloppy, right? Um, so what I've done is I've actually stacked this cello sound. It's a it's a group of I think it's it's four or eight cellos playing, uh, also spiccato. So it's providing the definition. So that sounds a lot more on point. So the beginning is is sort of setting the stage and, and establishing a baseline energy level from which we can kind of build up and, and come down if we want to. So we build up into this next section. So we've got the foundation of the spiccato strings happening here. We have the chords uh, playing in the brass and the woodwind, uh, lower brass and woodwinds here. And then we have the bones, uh, trombones and French horns providing the, uh, providing the melody. So what I did here to kind of keep the player off balance is that the melody in the horns and trombones comes in first and then the accompaniment chords enter in on the, the, fourth, eighth, the fourth count of that measure. One, two, three, four. And the timpani and crash cymbals are actually, they're underlined that happening too. You're expecting the accompaniment to come in right with the melody there, but by offsetting it there, again, keeping the player a little bit off balance. In addition to rhythmically trying to keep the player off balance, this melody is also a little bit uncomfortable. It's starting on the sharp four, flat five, uh, of this C sharp, uh, C sharp five chord I'm playing underneath it, which which makes it sound a little weird, a little off balance. And then it's playing around in major and minor modes because we've got the the major third of the F, and then the last note of this kind of phrase goes down to the minor third. Sounds major there, and then puts another spin on it there. So you kind of think you know where you are in terms of this melody, but then it throws a little bit of a curveball at you there. So here it goes up to the A major instead of going down to another minor chord. That's part of the kind of going back between uncomfortable and inspiring. That chord, you know, feels very triumphant uh, when, when you put it kind of at the end of that musical phrase. Next section, these are called polychords. Usually when you stack two different uh, chords on top of each other and you kind of let them fight. It's kind of like putting two chords in a, uh, in a death match and then, you know, seeing what happens. Uh, so the first chord comes in and then the next one happens and it just, it really contrasts and, and fights with the first chord. And 
And I also hang on to that chord for a little bit more drama at the end here. We're in six, eight, and this is where this is happening right here. We're in six, eight, and I actually go for an extra bar, extra three beats here uh, of holding on to that chord. Because again, thwarting the listener's expectations. If, if they're used to, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, they've been listening to that, you know, all 48 seconds so far. So they're thinking that everything's just going to go in these bars of six, but now we kind of hold on to it for an extra three bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then back into six again. And then uh, keeping the player off balance again. Here we kind of have these little shots that are coming at sort of odd intervals. <laughs> So this next section we break it down and you might think it that makes it you know re relaxes the energy a little bit it does but then it kind of re immediately ratches it back up as you realize you don't really know kind of what time signature in anymore it sort of breaks the time signature so this actually breaks down into a 4-4 four -four section probably starting here I, I don't always notate the uh, time signature properly and Pro Tools, if it's just something that I have to keep track of, it, it works out here and on the even even bar it kind of comes out. So this, uh, just to quickly mention, this cymbal sound is actually from a uh, library called Cinecrash by Cinesamples, another uh, great product from them. I use the brass and the woodwind section. Their instruments are so playable. They, they're a lot of fun to play. Uh, and in this case, the crash cymbal, you can, uh, you hit the roll just by playing a, like a G here and then you can control the velocity of the roll with the mod wheel and it also has the the piatti the crash cymbals two different varieties and you can get a much bigger sound by playing both of them at the same time i, I use a, this library a lot i love playing around with different time signatures especially when they uh come out feeling right like i this sort of breaks it down and breaks down your expectations of the the six eight feel. You know, one two three four five six. One two three four five six. These uh, trombones playing so loose with the with the time signature. Da, 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 and then we can move into the four four time signature, uh, just nice and smoothly. <laughs> Now this section is a call back to a section level that uh, it's kind of the dark superhero feel. We have these big kind of chords and we have the uh, orchestra chimes playing down here, sort of echoing the, the chords that are going on. And just, you know, big percussion kind of doing its thing down here. It's not always about constant playing uh, for me in the percussion sections. A lot of times when you break it down just to these like to these beats, it just sounds so brutal. And, and the space in between it gives it just a little bit of uh, restraint that makes it feel that much more. Uh, just, it just makes it feel a lot heavier. Now these chords here that the bones are playing kind of key to that dark superhero feel. There's really, it's very simple, right? It's just, it's two chords. Just sort of, you know, given this little rhythm. But the first one's pretty dark. The second one's light. And that's what I think that the, the dark superhero vibe winds up being. You, you know, oh, it's dark. It's dark. But it's heroic. You know, it's a, he's a superhero. So these are two very simple chords. Uh, it's just a D minor and a uh, C sharp major. Now, the reason that it goes from feeling kind of dark to light is that the, the the root movement here. So the root is, on the first chord, is just playing the root of the chord D. On the C sharp major chord, it's playing the F, so the third of that chord. And 
and that third in the in the bass actually a little twist to it it's not it's not a full-on major chord it's not full-on happy triumphant it's there's a little bit of an asterisk you know that's sort of the tortured part of it and we have these uh horns and bones kind of playing this little fanfare uh section sort of at a time just whenever the heck they feel like it <laughs> And again, hopefully lets us get back into that 6-8. So shifting shifting the kind of pulse uh, of this, again, is is keeping the player off off balance, even though uh, we know by looking at it, we're, we're trying to get back to the 6-8 so that we can loop around back to the beginning of the tune again. triumphant themes here going back to the uncomfortableness. So these are uh, some pretty dissonant chords here in the in the strings. It's using a lot of, you can't get much more dissonant than uh, this interval, and interval is just the space between notes. This guy's playing just going back and forth between those two notes and that's a semitone so this is actually the uh the jaws interval it's the da, da, aggressive in its dissonance it's it's one of the most kind of jarring intervals you can have so if i just play these if, if you're looking for a very simple statement of aggression you know that's that semitone you know feels really aggressive you can play it like in the low strings you know immediately just just sounds dark and aggressive you know you have to start the track in in a key so I usually wind up just picking a key and then i wind up wandering all over a bunch of different keys throughout the course of the of the tune so probably about a minute and a half in i as i'm writing i start looking for ways to get back to the original uh, to the original key signature so I can make the loop cleanly and here it it's really handy because this is supposed to be really dissonant so whatever key I'm in I can just switch to the initial key and even if it sounds really jarring um, th that dissonance is you probably won't notice it uh, amongst the rest of the dissonance to the beginning again all right so that's uh that's sort of my approach to action music uh in a nutshell it's really just about trying to create as much pulse pounding adrenaline action as you can by sort of switching it up on the listener you don't you don't want them to get ever you don't want them ever to get too comfortable in a section um so there's a lot of times when i'll if i'll use a theme i might not finish it right because you expect to hear a theme finished well i think that's about that's about all I got for you on this one, guys. Please leave any comments or questions you have down in the comment section. I'll try and address them in upcoming videos. Also, please hit my website up, uh, nelsoneverheart.com. And thanks for listening.